Hey, everybody. Welcome. So nice to uh, see you all here. Well, see you, sort of. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, many of you know my work. I've been in this business for 30 some years and written for a bunch of different websites and magazines. Now I'm kind of doing a freelance thing and really happy that uh, Phil asked me to participate here. So I'm super happy to welcome Chris Deutsch and Rob Buddy, both from JVC. Chris, Chris how you Scott, doing, man? I'm doing really good. This is uh, this is new. This is cool. I know. I know. It's super cool. And uh, yeah. Rob, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me, Scott. I appreciate it. You bet. Now, it's so nice to to have this kind of an event since we don't have trade shows, right? So we usually I'm looking forward to CEDIA and CES and seeing you guys in person. Of course, we can't do that now. So this is kind of the next best thing. And it's kind of cool, actually. Don't you it think? It is. It is. Yeah, we Phil's done a great job setting it up, and uh, we got a projector ready to roll if we need it, and <laughs> lots of fun stuff to talk about. And we've got a lot of really good stuff to talk about, no doubt about it. Uh, in fact, there was a Cedia, so to speak, uh, or, or mid mid last month, mid September, uh, at which JVC introduced uh, made some pretty big announcements. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to go back just a year ago for starters mm -hmm. and uh, remind you in 2019 at Cedia, JVC introduced Frame Adapt HDR, right. uh, which is our dynamic tone mapping solution for our native 4K projectors. And so this year at Cedia, we introduced an improved Frame Adapt HDR and we added Theater Optimizer. So now we can do this dynamic tone mapping, but we can take into account the specifics of your room and your system. Wow, that's that sounds pretty good because obviously, as a reviewer, I've always had a tr trouble thinking about, well, I'm reviewing a projector in my room with my screen, mm -hmm. the colored of walls that I have, which are very dark, neutral gray, and so on, but not everyone's going to have that or the same screen. So, so JVC uh, has introduced this theater optimizer. And what we can uh, do is we can adapt to your screen size, your screen game. Uh, we can also do some things that no, not even an outboard device is capable of doing. We can adjust to the projector's lamp condition. And I'll explain that a little more in a moment. Um, in particular, the hours uh, that, that, the, that are on the lamp. And uh, we can take into account factors such as throw distance. And you may <laughs> wonder, how do we do that? So yeah, how uh, the heck so, do you do that? So let, let's first talk about frame adapt HDR. And again, this is our dynamic tone mapping solution. And, and I wanna just really briefly explain what this does and what the experience is like for the user. And I also wanna explain why it's necessary. And the reason frame adapt HDR is necessary in the first place is that there is no standard in Hollywood uh, or among the content creation community for HDR brightness. Okay, so we usually this is expressed in, in nits, and we might like uh, to have everything at a thousand nits. And, and when I say a thousand nits, I'm talking the max CLL, the brightest spot on the movie. And to be clear, we also understand that the whole movie doesn't hit that range. Yeah, um, really. There's quite a bit. There's max CLL, which is the brightest spot on the movie. And there's max FALL, which is generally a lower number, which is the, the, the brightest average frame in that movie. Now, as an example, again, I said we'd like it to be around 1,000 nits. Max um, CLL. Yes, I've seen titles as high as 9,919 nits. What? Which is, yep, Mad Max Fury Road. And uh, the most recent Men in Black, that was also well over 9,000. How can uh, that even be? There are no displays that do nine or 10,000. I got no idea, but it's this is Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there's a lot of titles around 4,000 nits. Uh, the Meg is one good example. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a lot of titles at 2,000 and 1,000, but then it goes lower. Uh, you can look on Disney Plus, you can see a lot of titles around 250. 
and uh, which is hardly but, HDR at all. Well, it, it looks pretty good. Uh, the titles I'm thinking about, even Blade Runner 2049, which is 181 nits max CLL, what? and I believe 73 nits on the frame average light level, the maximum. Wow. Yeah, so you can make any of these movies look good on almost any projector if you know how to change the settings, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, at taking two of these titles as an example, if I adjust a projector so that the Meg with 4,000 nits max CLL looks good, um, Yes, I can do that. But then if the next movie I want to watch happens to be Blade Runner at 181 nits, max CLL, and again, we know it varies literally from not only scene to scene, but even frame to frame. But if I put in the Blade Runner, it's going to look flat. It's going to look dull. It's, it's your projector got, set up for, for, uh, for, the, for Mad Max. Or, exactly. Or, uh, the Meg. Or the Meg. Yeah, as you were saying, Scott, it doesn't really look like HDR at all anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Now, conversely, I can make Blade Runner look pretty good. But again, I got to change all the settings. Okay. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm changing the tone mapping for the projector. Okay. But if Blade Runner is the movie that I set up, and then the next movie I put in is the Meg or Mad Max, now those movies are going to look horribly overcooked too mm -hmm. bright oversaturated just washed out they're not going to look right either so that what what the big benefit jvc has created is we are the first and and to my understanding still the only home theater projector where i can put in the mag i can put in blade runner i can put in mad max i can go to disney plus i can literally watch whatever i want and get a consistent, excellent experience and never have to change a single menu setting. Hmm. And now- Wow, that sounds like, mighty good to me. <laughs> yeah, for, for folks like you that maybe are a little more technically inclined, there are some additional controls and you can kind of fine tune that and dial it in a little more if you want, but that's optional. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we look at the brightness of each of, of the video, either scene by scene or frame by frame. I like frame by frame better. I, I think it responds a little quicker and I don't see any negative artifacts. I was gonna say, wouldn't that, wouldn't that though slow down the processing? If it's having to analyze every frame, it does, doesn't. doesn't that slow things down? It doesn't. It doesn't. We got, we got some pretty cool technology inside say, there. That's a hell of a processor you got in there. It is. And a big question people have is, well, what about Dolby Vision? Come on, I'm waiting. Okay. What about what? Dolby Vision? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dolby Vision has a base layer of HDR10. And mm -hmm. let's take Apple TV as an example. The Apple TV and the JVC projector are smart enough to talk to each other. And again, the customer simply selects, like, I just watched Ford versus Ferrari. Mm. Great movie, by the I way. Haven't, I haven't seen that one yet. I've, I've been meaning to. It's it's fun. And and like any other movie, it is a now this is a Dolby Vision title, but all I do on my Apple TV is I select it. In this case, I also had to purchase it. Um, but then you enjoy you enjoy it. There, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to change any settings. You don't have to worry, is it gonna look right or not, too bright, too dark? The JVC takes care of all of that. Because and it's only now, looking at the base layer, the HDR10 layer. It's not looking exactly. at the Dolby Vision. Uh, enhancement layer. Exactly. Um, but we are dynamically tone mapping it um, actually on a frame by frame basis if you want. So we give you really the best possible experience with that Dolby Vision content. Almost now, the same effect as as looking at the enhancement layer in Dolby yeah, Vision. Because I, exactly. I was just going to say that the reason why you have Dolby Vision is the projector or the TV's not can't read it itself. Um, but if the projector is fast enough to read it itself, you just give me the video, I'll know, I, and I know what to do with it. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, if you if you have a device, a display that can read something dynamically and measure it and analyze it frame by frame, the the projector is going to make a very good decision based on its own environment. 
So it's only for that TV that can't really figure it out and they need a little Someone has to tell me what two plus two is, but this projector is fast <laughs> enough and smart enough to figure out what two plus two is itself. So I don't need I don't need you to tell me that particular number. Right? Exactly. So so what we really this is what we've already had. We already do all, all everything I'm describing to you. What's new is the theater optimizer part. So now when you're setting up the projector, you can input the screen size and the screen gain. Uh, there is also a setting for screen material. The screen material is optional. We have, I believe, 168 codes. And uh, so if you have an SI slate, or if you have a Stuart Studio Tech 130, or if you have Elite, or if you have whoever else, we have a whole list of codes and you can enter the codes. That will find, that'll help the projector fine tune the color um, but that is not necessary for the theater optimizer. Um, after that, the projector now looks at how many hours are on the lamp. And every 100 hours, the projector makes a little adjustment to keep your picture right. Mm. That's cool. That's, That's new. No one's cool. ever done that. Super yeah. Super cool. And so we know the screen size. We also know where you set the zoom because it's a motorized zoom. Mm -hmm. So we can figure out the throw distance. Okay. Yep. Um, so so uh, take, take, for example, customers that maybe have a constant image height system with an ultra wide screen, and uh, they're going to zoom from 16 by 9 to ultra wide, 235, 240, whatever you got. Now, in that case, this, the throw distance is the same in both cases. But the screen size changed, the projected image size changed, yep. and for each lens memory, it saves it independently. Mm. So you do have to, for the 235 screen, when you're using lens memory, it is still projecting a 16 by 9 image. Yep. So you need to calculate the equivalent 16 by 9 image, but that's pretty easy. Um, and should you be using an anamorphic lens, it will also take into consideration which anamorphic scaling mode you're using yeah like that so it already it already it knows obviously all of these things that are happening inside the projector and mm -hmm. you're just making really good use of that information exactly well hold on there's a couple of questions and i just want to sure. make sure that people really understand some of the things that you were saying the sure. first thing is um some um one question is the difference between frame by frame and scene by scene i i tested both what I the well, idea, supposed to know more like um, what do you how do you define a frame and how do you just define a scene? How long is a scene? Is it does it mean like it is it like scene, oh it's not a dark scene anymore it's a bright scene? How do you define that? Is what a they're asking. Scene is a, a more substantial change in the picture, and frame by frame is literally just what that says. I tried it out, and what I found I found that in the frame by frame mode. Um, and, and I was looking at a title on Disney Plus, and I switched between frame by frame and scene by scene, and I found with frame by frame, it stayed a little bit brighter because it reacted a little more quickly to small changes, and yet at no point did I ever feel there was someone in the background riding a control. I didn't see any artifacts, but it, I, I liked any frame by frame. Or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing too, somebody asked about, is it relying on the metadata of the disk? No, it's no. not. I, only no. metadata needs to know is, hey, the flag that says, hey, I'm HDR. After that, it says, move out of the way. You just you tell it. me what the video is doing and I'll handle the rest of it myself. That's right, right? that's so right. We actually have one here, which we'll play with a little later, but um, yeah. I just wanna Man, bring that up. I gotta I think, tell you, that's really important because because the you can't really trust the metadata in the content. Right. Uh, you know, there's very often the, the Mac CLL is not even listed, uh, you know, not even specified and a lot of other data too. So, mm -hmm. you know, just relying on what the projector is actually seeing uh, makes a big difference, I think. And, and, and metadata, when you're talking Mac CLL and Max FALL, it's two numbers that are selected to represent an entire movie. Mm -hmm. And we all know that movie is bright scenes and dark scenes mm -hmm. and, and changes. So, right. so we're reacting within the movie. This, this shows a couple of the of the basic menu uh, uh, pages uh, from, and, and we, we have improved the menu on this projector. So in the basic frame adapt HDR uh, 
function, there's now five-step correction. There's a little wider range of adjustments. Um, but if okay. you turn on the feeder optimizer, then you go to a different page, and now you have the page you can see here where you enter the screen size and the screen gain. If, if we go into theater optimizer, we can enter the screen size, we can enter the screen gain, and where it says screen setting, we can go in, we can enter in. Philip, I see you're operating it live. Uh, just have it turned on, go down to screen setting, and select that, and you'll notice it's off. Uh, I know Screen Innovations is coming up next. I happen to have a Screen Innovations slate, so I can tell if you turn that on and if you entered 114, that would be the correct code for a Screen innovation slate. And it's just a three-digit number. Now, again, this, this is logical to put it in this section, but it's also not required for the theater optimizer. So 114, that would be the code for SI Slate. And there's different codes for Stuart and for Elite and for Daylight and for 168 different materials in general. Yeah, yeah um, so the 089 was the Elite screen that I actually have um, in my in my system. So that's mm -hmm. where that number was actually in the uh, on the system as well. That's and and I, I want to explain one other one other thing. Um, there's an optimized level, which is low, medium, and high. And what I want to clarify, some people said, well, why isn't there an auto? And I want you to think of these as low auto, medium auto, and high auto. <laughs> the reason we have low, medium, and high is we realize there's a little bit of season to taste going Oops. on here. I'm going to turn my camera back on. When I say season to taste, some people like things a little brighter a little darker, kind of right in the middle. Um, some rooms need a little more, a little less. So with that low, medium, and high, we give you the ability to fine tune it uh, to your room. And all three of those then respond in that automatic range, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. And uh, we also have discrete codes that the factory has promised us so that for an advanced user, if you want to change these things from one title to another, you would have that option uh, without drilling into the whole menu. So we can go ahead and go on to the next slide, and that's the improved usability. So this is really cool. And I have another screen capture from the new menu. And what I want you to see is that we now have this auto picture mode select. And we have four presets, one for SDR 2D, one for SDR 3D, one for HDR 10, and one for hybrid log gamma. So for all four signal types, you can now lock in the preferred signal that you want the projector to always go to when it sees that signal. And the way this works is it can detect and change that picture based on either, say, the colorimetry, if, for example, if it's a REC 709 signal, it knows it's SDR, unless, and it knows it's 2D unless it sees the 3D flag, and then it knows it's 3D. So uh, if, it, if it's HDR, you know, HDR10, you can program that in. If it's hybrid log gamma, you can program that in separate. And for all of these, you have a, a choice of, here, here you see pretty much what the defaults are, but if you want to create a custom setting uh, of your own preference, you have that ability. Uh, we've also improved the JVC calibration software. And uh, in the past, uh, the gamma calibration was applied globally uh, to the gamma setting for SDR and to the ETOF setting for HDR. Now the color adjustment can also be applied globally uh, when within, you within the color management software. system, within the color management system or CMS, right? Correct. And and uh, Rob, do you want to add a little bit to that? As far as the calibration software, the CMS, we're doing a global adjustment for the color gamut and the color. Let me pull up my video so you can see my face. Let's 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 see you, Rob. So um, yeah, with the calibration software, we're able to basically profile the whole machine. So the color, the color gamut, all three at the same time. And so as an end user, you can look at before and after 
and you can see where the calibration is on the machine. And so you can decide, yeah, it looks really good or it's off. You can redo it if you like and restart over, but there's a lot of different options um, that a calibrator end user would be able to set up his machines. So. Now, and, and I should, I, oh, Scott, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was just gonna say, it's a good thing to be able to apply the EOTF and the CMS across globally across all the inputs, but there would be other cases, I think, where you might want to have different settings of those correct. for each input. I assume that's and, possible. Correct, and you do have that option. So you can basically calibrate the whole machine, but if you wanna get more specific and make sure that it's right on, you can go to Pacific HDR10 gamma curve or EOT curve EOTF. and make sure that's exactly where you have it. So. Mm -hmm. And the other now, thing I want to make sure everybody knows is that is that the JVC calibration software is an actual program that you get from JVC and run on a Windows machine. Mm -hmm. And and there's two meters right. that this is compatible with. And Rob, that's the Spider X and help me again. The iPro two. Yes. Spider X. Yes. Spider X. <laughs> Bill has we, we, we have Vanna White. On, so on the white, screen, the yeah. white one is the Spider X <laughs> and iPro 2 there. Um, yes. They're very, very good meters. iPro 2 is a lot more sensitive if you're going to be, but they but it's it slow. Costs more too, so. <laughs> but it's slow. Slow. Yeah, but a couple of things about this that I think is kind of cool because somebody was asking about um, what sort of adjustments is it making at 100 hours. The cool thing about the projector, as you're using this um, theater optimizer, it knows that the, the lamp is on 400 hours. So it's not waiting to 100 hours to make the adjustment. It's constantly making the adjustment as the lamp ages. If you want to, and then you could take the, the calibration software, and I'm, I'm assuming if you want it to, you can, you, could, you can do it when it's new, and then after about 100 hours, do it again to make sure that, and then, and then, and then compare your results. So that's kind of neat too, right? Yeah, and the calibration only takes like 15 minutes. It's very easy to to set up and run. Um, so if somebody wants to calibrate, you know, as their lamp burns down, they have that option. They can do that. Uh, there is a Panasonic picture mode, I should mention, and that is another one of the uh, uh, options that you have for HDR10, and that's compatible with the Panasonic Blu-ray players, which are exceptional. Uh, that Model 9000 is just an amazing uh, Blu-ray player, and uh, so we have a special picture mode for that. And now, it does, now the the 9000 does its own tone mapping if you want. Exactly. So I I mean a lot of people are just going to say I'm going to let JVC use the tone mapping, but we went to a lot of effort to create this Panasonic mode. And Scott, I, I don't think I explained this to you, but you can actually do HDMI one and HDMI two separately. So you could have most of your components going into HDMI 1, and you could use Frame Adapt HDR. And if you like what the Panasonic mode does uh, on HDMI 2, you could feed the Panasonic there, and you could set that for the Panasonic picture mode. Wow, okay? that's cool. So that's cool. It's, it's just another option that's out there. This is all part of what I call feature forward. And what that means is JVC uh, now over time has added a lot of cool features to our projectors at no additional cost to our customers. And the response has been very, very favorable. Um, back in March of 2019, we uh, first added these Panasonic modes uh, to, uh, to these projectors, the DLA NX5, 7, and 9, and the DLA RS1000, 2000, 3000. In June of 2019, we updated our flagship projector, the DLA RS4500. We added auto tone mapping and the Panasonic color profiles. Um, then in October of last year, we added Frame Adapt HDR to these models. And now we've added the theater optimizer and all the other things that we've talked about. So what we can do now is just take a quick run through the line. So there's JVC Consumer and there's JVC Pro. Uh, these are essentially the same projector just sold through two different channels. And, and Scott, again, you and I talked about this the other day. Um, this I've is, always found this confusing. I know, I know. JVC Consumer has their own customers. Uh, JVC Consumer for many years was television sets and car stereos and headphones and camcorders, and to some degree it still is, mm -hmm. and part of their customer base is home theater. 
JVC Pro as broadcast cameras, uh, projectors for the simulation market, for yep. medical imaging. Yep. But again, we have home theater customers. So much like General Motors has different divisions that sell very similar vehicles, we have different divisions that sell very similar projectors. Mm -hmm. So the DLA NX5 and the DLA RS1000 are very, very similar. Um, gold ring, silver ring on the front there. Uh, this is our 1800 lumen projector with 40,000 to one native contrast. The DILA chips, this is our claim to fame, the best black level and the best contrast in the industry. These have the new improved frame adapt HDR with the theater optimizer. And even at this low price point, they have 10 installation modes, also known as lens memories for use with an ultra widescreen system. And what are we so talking about price point wise? Uh, the, we have what we we have map pricing on these, which would be fifty nine ninety nine. Okay. And so if we go to the next model, the DLA NX seven, also known as the DLA RS two thousand, this is a little bit brighter, nineteen hundred lumens. It doubles the contrast. That's not just a different number; it's actually different parts in the light engine. The contrast is because it has a second aperture so it can better control stray light. You'll also notice it has a cinema filter, which gives us an expanded color uh, reproduction, over 100% of DCI P3. And again, that's an additional part in the light engine that you can move into the light path when you want that wider color, and you can move it out of the light path if you want a little bit more uh, brightness. By the way, that cinema filter, I think, affects green primarily, right? I, I think it affects all, but I think probably green the oh, it most. Affects, it affects all. It's it does affect the whole all. Item. Okay, okay. Thank you, Rob. So so now we get to our 8K E-Shift projectors, and this would be the DLA NX9 or the DLA RS3000. So these are the first projectors. They have the same input. They take a 4K signal, um, but inside the projector, they scale it to 8K, and then they display it using our E-Shift technology and they display it through an upgraded lens. Uh, this is our larger 100 millimeter diameter lens. Now, every JVC projector we're gonna show you today is all glass lens. Most manufacturers can't say that. So the, the two models we've already talked about, all glass lens, but this is a larger all glass lens. Mm -hmm. It is one grade sharper. Because it's larger, it passes more light. That's how we get up to 2,200 lumens. Mm -hmm. um, this lens has a little more precise mechanism, which helps with those lens memories when you're changing the aspect. Mm -hmm. And it has a little wider shift range. Mm -hmm. um, so, so before we go on, let's talk a little bit about the contrast thing, because that is what that has always been JVC's claim to fame. So. Okay, so so one of the questions Dan asked, you know, how do you measure native contrast? Native contrast is without using the dynamic dimming from the aperture. Okay. It, it still is what is the blackest we can get and what is what's the blackest black and what's the brightest white. Okay. But um, disable but disabling the dynamic iris. Dynamic iris. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, we disable still... the dynamic iris when we okay. measure contrast right yeah. now. So, so this model is twenty two hundred lumens and it's a hundred thousand to one native and a million to one dynamic. And to Philip's point, the 100,000 to one native, that's what we're known for. Again, the DILA black levels, the DILA contrast, that's what makes a JVC the exceptional projector that it is. I also I want to totally mention- I agree with that. <laughs> now, somebody's Thanks, asking, somebody's asking, why no laser? I want a laser. Everybody likes I, their lasers. You're one slide too early. Let's let's go. Show me the next slide. Wait, before we get there, we, we mentioned the price. Of, we mentioned the price of the NX5. What about the seven and the nine? Um, so the NX7 slash RS2000 is 89.99. The NX9 slash RS3000 is 17,999. Okay. And now we go to the laser. <laughs> Those are all lamp-based we've talked about so far. Yes. Laser. Okay. <laughs> now the laser. Laser. Okay, so Philip, if you want to bring up the next slide. So the DLA RS4500, this is our 3000 lumen blue essence laser phosphor DILA projector. Um, this is the projector that got the auto tone mapping update for 4K HDR. 
Um, this is the projector that has 20,000 hours with the laser. This was originally a $35,000 retail. Uh, Scott, you're, you probably want to know the price on this one too, right? I do, I do. <laughs> it's 24999 so it's come down $10,000. Huh. Um, that's, that's not a bad chunk of change there. And it's still considered by many people to be the best home theater projector you can buy. Not only is it laser and a lot of lumens, but it's also a very substantial chassis. The RS3000 is a relatively petite 48 pounds, whereas the RS4500 is 86 pounds. Holy smokes. And it's also about 10 inches deeper. So uh, you do need to make sure that you got, you know, the space to, to install that. Um, it's a fantastic projector. It's a phenomenal uh, value now, and it continues to sell very, very well for JVC. I just want to make um, sure we understand, though, that that this one does not have um, theater optimizer, correct? Or frame adapt. So or this frame one, adapt. going back to the question earlier, this one can auto tone map, but it does rely on the metadata. Mm. Okay. And now, um, what some people will do, they'll take that ten thousand dollars they saved, and mm. they will invest in a uh, well-known mm. uh, outboard processor. Mm -hmm. Lumagen. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, so you can get a you can get a Lumagen and this projector and have enough money left over for a pretty nice vacation for less than what the projector alone originally sold Used for. To cost, yeah. Not a bad deal. Not so bad we deal. have one other laser. Let's go one more slide. At the opposite end of the price range, we have the LXNZ3, and it's available in either the black cabinet or the white cabinet. This is a 3000 lumen laser at a $3699 retail, $3,699. This is a much smaller projector, okay? Yeah. It's DLP. It does have a 1.6X zoom. It does have a respectable amount of lens shift, both vertically, vertically sorry, and horizontally. Dang, and it does have much. auto tone mapping, again, based on metadata. This is a good projector for an affordable home theater or for what I call a big TV application. Yeah, where I've actually, want... I was going to say, we reviewed it. Um, like you said, if you have a game room or media room and you want to rely mm -hmm. the 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 carefree maintenance of a laser and you need some lumens to kind of pierce mm -hmm. it at ambient light, it, it, it's a good performer. And and if you, we... uh, click, if you click one more slide, you'll see it in white. And then if you click one more slide, you'll see the recap of our full lineup. Okay. And this includes our $2,499 entry-level DLP, which is uh, a 2000 lumen projector and uses the DLP version of 4K E-Shift, very much like the little laser projector does. Let's answer some questions. Let's so I've it. been trying to, I've been throwing some out. Somebody was asking about the contrast ratio on the big guy. The laser is just mm -hmm. listed as infinite. I'm taking that is dynamic. Is there a native contrast measurement for that particular projector? We, we have never officially published a native spec on that projector. Uh, to be perfectly candid with you, the way it works is a little bit different. Most people do use the dynamic laser dimming and are very happy with the results. And even if you turn it off, it's still a DILA, but it is it is not going to give you with the laser dimming turned off the kind of contrast that even uh, the NX5 or RS1000 would give you. But if you turn it on, it's considered the best contrast of any JVC projector. So it's okay. you know what it's its own animal. Yeah, and that's on that one. I'm not. I'm not aware of a single customer that has taken delivery of that projector that has ever complained about the contrast. Okay. Um, and one, and then, one other quick point about that is that that in that case you're dim you're dynamically dimming the laser. You don't have a physical iris, correct? Yes. Well, well, well we 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 do. also have an, we have a physical iris setting, Scott. So great point, Scott. You can you can dial in the exact foot lamberts of brightness that you want to put on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, through low, medium, or high laser, and by using our manual aperture. 
and then you can engage the laser dimming, which will further enhance the contrast. But the iris okay. is a static iris. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Got it. Okay. So the the bluish, what type is that? The laser that's in it? Is it um is it blue with um phosphor? With yeah, it's, phosphor? it's a it's a blue laser with a yellow phosphor. Mm -hmm. So some of that blue laser light goes right into the light engine mm -hmm. uh, for the blue channel. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Other blue light uh, excites that yellow phosphor, creates yellow light, which is split into red and green. Uh -huh. And that's how we create the colors there. And then when you put the color filter on it, you're still going to expand it beyond to DCI-P3. So you're getting the colors that you're looking the for. Cinema, the right. cinema filter, I think. Cinema filter, excuse the me. Cinema filter, yeah. Okay. Um, here's a great one. What about HDMI 2.1 on a projector? You know, I, I got this crystal ball here, man, but it got it got a little foggy today, and I, I I'm sorry. I yeah. I, I have a saying. I, I can't I tell you what. I can't tell you when. You know, there are some advantages that you may like eventually on a projector. You know, variable refresh rate, auto latency mode, quick media switching. That would be great on a projector, but Right now, there's what are you going to plug into it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this so. is this is as state of the art as projectors currently are, yeah. and and you know who knows down the road, who knows? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but the but HDMI two point one receiving chips are still getting um, out there. They're barely out there at all right now, so yeah. we're yeah. waiting on them. Yeah, and I will tell you, people keep saying, "Well, I'm waiting for the new game system." I'm not sure if you guys heard this. Somebody actually said, "We're going to try." To actually game at 8K at like 8K60. So they went out and they bought the biggest um, graphics card. It's called a uh, Nvidia Titan X. It retails for about $2,700, and they wow. stuck it in a $15,000 gaming rig, Jeez. and it choked. It choked at 29 frames per second on at 8K. So <laughs> on, you know, Bro, now, I, was, I wanted to buy one of those. I was going to go out and get one of those this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so basically, there's a theoretical thing. So if I have a white yeah. guy, a, a guy standing in front of a white background, the, uh, a lot of game systems or these computers have no problem probably ramping up to do um, 8K 60 or 4K 120. The second I'm, I have to draw trees, plants, buildings, nine other people, all the dirt, all the rocks, the cars in the background. Then it can't really do that, which is why the where the variable refresh rate comes in. So every once in a while, you'll see the game system jump up to 120 because it's a white background, and you'll see yeah. it drop back down to like 25 frames per second because when the movie when the game actually gets going. So and you know what I mean? We're we're having a little fun here, but the reality is, it, I, I think Scott, you said it. It it's it's a matter of the content being available, and and right now what people want is a good home theater. And people want to be able to enjoy time with their family in their home and stay safe. Watching a and, good movie. Exactly. exactly. And and the content that's out there, the JVC projectors are the state of the art in terms of connectivity. Mm -hmm. They're the state of the art in terms of HDR. They're as plug and play as it gets. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's a really yeah. really powerful combination right there. And I and I think exactly. I think we're pretty good with that. And obviously over time things will change. But, you know, right now, uh, if you want the best you can get, we'd like to suggest that it's JVC. Yeah. And let's be honest. Most people who are buying these JVCs or, or projector at this level are movie buffs. Yep, <laughs> you know? exactly. And, yep. and yep. guess what? Movies are still shot in 24P. Why? Because we like the way they look that way. Well, so, yeah, some of us do. Some of us do, and then half of the guys go off with. Yeah, some half are old school, go off some with, are not. So. Yeah, some of some of that, but how many? You know how many? Um, uh, what do they call it? Soap opera effect arguments I've had when they saw like Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk or or some of, of these movies that are done at higher There's higher rates. Right? Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, I maybe we could do a whole old, session on frame rate school. if we wanted to, which is writing. I like high frame rate. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I like it on certain things too. And I can see where um, 24P can hide the fact that that building is held up by a stick, and <laughs> and directors and, and direct kind of like that, yeah, you know. Yeah, so yeah. so we'll I, see. I really enjoyed 60P <laughs> last night for the Broncos game. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sports. Well, sports. Action makes yeah. total sense. Yeah. Sports total and stuff sense. like that. Mm -hmm. Did you guys see? Did you guys see Gemini Man, another of Ang Lee's high frame rate movies? Horrible movie, really awful. <laughs> but, but the motorcycle chase scene mm -hmm. was, oh my god, 
I want to check that out. That is that's worth that that disc right there. Just that scene at sixty frames. Okay. Yeah, the clarity um, somebody, in that movie is well done. So okay. Well somebody. Okay, there's a couple more questions before we wrap up. So um, let me look here. I have to. I'm an old man trying to look at a tiny screen. <laughs> uh, that's why I use a 55 inch TV for my my computer monitor. It makes it a lot easier. A lot um, easier. Someone mentions that they have an X5000. Um, and it still looks fantastic after 3,100 hours. Look at that, JVC quality right there. Um, right there. Mm -hmm. Right That's there. That's their model. They must. They must be over in Europe. <laughs> oh yeah, we get. We get. We're, we have a little international audience here. And someone nice. says I have an RS640 with a panamorphic lens. Will nice. the NX7 be? Uh, um, be uh, would would the NX7 be an upgrade or sideways I, move, or would it be I best to purchase an NX9? I can tell you, I had an RS640, and then I got an NX5, and I immediately uh, – now, I'll tell you, I have a multi-purpose room. I don't have a back cave, mm -hmm. so I'll qualify that. But in terms of the HDR and not needing to adjust anything, mm -hmm. and in terms of just the clarity of the native 4K, mm -hmm. I thought the RS1000 was an improvement over the 640 that I – had literally been watching the day before. Exactly. So I will tell you that you have some, like there's some hardcore JVC fans out there. Giorgios is, or, or Giorgio, Giorgios? He's at, it's 1 a.m. where he's located. So it's, mm. he's wow. somewhere, he's somewhere way over there. Um, and, of course, and then someone says, they're asking about an X790 um, versus uh, an X790. Yeah, so the, the X790 is still a current model. Again, with an X790, which is also sold as an RS540, you you would have to have a certain amount of knowledge on changing your tone mapping from movie to movie. Now, we talked about Panasonic Blu-ray players. They have that their own uh, mm -hmm. HDR optimizer. And so mm -hmm. if you got an X790 or an RS540, I would encourage you to get a Blu-ray player like a Panasonic mm -hmm. that has its own HDR optimizer. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, that doesn't help you out on your Apple TV or or, or your yeah. video games. Yeah, yeah. but Lumichin. But anyway, um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, now the questions are starting to come um, fast and heavy, but we're going to have to get ready for our next session so so thank you guys um for, for coming for, it's always you, a Phil. pleasure thank you scott and appreciate it i look yeah, forward thanks, to seeing Robin, you Chris. again um and by you, the way you're not you, your, i'm keeping your nx9 forever ever 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 <laughs> ever okay. i know where you live so. <laughs> he knows where i live <laughs> he's gonna have to come repo it all right hey, so, thanks you guys really appreciate right. it